Hello everyone, thanks for choosing Database and API as your phase one project. My name is David Lin and I will be walking you through this project from the theory to the practice. From the beginning to the end, this section will give you a taste on all of the different technologies that goes into making something useful, as well as preparing you for a more exciting and challenging phase two. Before I begin, I would like to show you the end result of this section so you know what to expect. By the end of this section, you should be able to create, read, update, delete information from a database hosted on Azure Cloud through a RESTful API via HTTP requests. Before we start with the hows, let's take a look at whys and the whats. As we're in the digital age, we are constantly using our smartphones and computers to connect to the rest of the world. This wouldn't be possible without a large amount of databases around the world. Every text you type, every time you log into your account, every Facebook post you look at, all involve databases. Databases help organize this information so that it is easy to query, sort, and manipulate these massive amount of data. Databases are usually organized in the forms of tables. This is an example of a table. As you can see on the top, we have the list of different attributes, student IDs, student names, and date of birth. Each time we create a new information in database, we are inserting into a record. As you can see, there are three records in this database. Another thing worth mentioning is that the presence of student ID. This is called the primary key. Each record in the database should have a unique way of identifying themselves. Therefore, each table in the database needs to have a primary key. If we have multiple tables, the information in each table could link to another one. This concept of relating one table to another is an important concept in database design. In phase one, we'll create only one table. Keep an eye out on phase two for more concepts such as database normalization and relational databases. Once we've created the database, how do we interact with it? We can use SQL, Structured Query Language, to interact with the database. In this example, the query will return all the columns that have the record 8268654 in the student ID field from student table. Note that the asterisk symbol means select all records that satisfy the constraint. Also, notice all SQL query has a semicolon in the end to indicate the end of one query. I will show you where to use SQL to interact with the database when we dive into Azure portal. Here is another example of an SQL query. In this query, we're trying to create a table called students in the database. In the first half, the non-capitalized part marks the name of the fields. The second half gives the information on the data type that the database can expect. For example, ID can only have integers, name can have up to 50 characters, and date of birth expects a date format. Note now indicates that the field cannot be empty. An identity 1-1 tells the database to give the first record, the ID of 1, second, the ID of 2, and so on. Here are a few additional resources that will help you to understand databases in SQL. Feel free to take a look at it. This PowerPoint will also be on the documentation so you wouldn't have to type in the link manually. An API, Application Programming Interface, allows one piece of software to talk to another piece of software. This may be a bit abstract, so let me give you a more concrete example. Imagine you're in a Subway store. You are eager to get some toasted sandwich. You don't make your own sandwich in a Subway store, right? You give the instructions to the Subway staff, and they will toast your sandwich. You don't need to care where to get the oven from or how to fiddle with the settings. You just want a toasted sandwich. This is API in a nutshell. You give the API some instructions, the API does something in the back, possibly talking to another API, and the API will give you the information you desire. REST is an API architecture that centers around manipulating resources. It has the following properties. Uniform interface, client, server, stateless, cacheable, layered system, code on demand. Explaining all of these probably will take another whole video series. If you're interested, please visit the link in the end. RESTful service usually means sending and receiving information through HTTP. HTTP methods are used to determine what action you want to execute on a specific resource. For example, a GET request tells the server, Hey, can I get some information for this resource? A POST request indicates that new information are coming in. PUT requests updates or replaces a specified resource. And DELETE, as the name suggests, deletes the resource. There are more HTTP methods out there such as patch and trace and head, but you only need to know these four basic methods. Also, I would like to briefly mention HTTP status code, which help us understand what is going on when the API doesn't behave as desired. 200 or 201 means successful. The server understood your request and did the instruction that you assigned to it. 
4xx indicates a client error. The HTTP request contains illegal actions. Usually there's a fault at the client that made the request. I believe all of you encountered 404 error at some point of your life. That's saying the resource cannot be found. 5xx means there's an error on the server. Maybe there's a bug in the server or maybe the server made a request to another server and that server did not behave correctly. As promised before, here are a few links that will help you to understand RESTful API concepts. I will be walking you through creating an SQL database on Azure Portal. To start, go to portal.azure.com and log in with your student email. Once you're logged in, you should be able to see this UI. We need to create a database, so go to the search bar on the top and search for SQL database. And just click on that service. Now you shouldn't be able to see anything in here because you haven't created anything, so let's go ahead and click on Add to create a new SQL database. In here, we need to configure our SQL database. So go ahead and go to the subscription and select your Azure for Students. And let's go ahead and create a new resource group. The resource group name could be anything you like. But for the purpose of this video, I would call it School SIMS, School Student Information Management System. And just click on OK. Now we need to enter our database detail. The database name can be anything you like, but choose a name that makes sense in your context. We need to create a new server. So go ahead and click on create new and type in the web URL you desire. This could be anything you like as before. Choose something that makes sense to you. I would call it NZMSA School SIMS. And just go ahead and type in your username and password. We will need to use this later, so remember to put it in a notebook. But remember not to use your personal password because we will be requiring you to post your source code on GitHub. Just go ahead and click on select. Now, and now the server is created. We don't have to do anything for the SQL Elastic tool, so just leave it as no. When it comes to compute and storage, we need to choose this cheapest option so it doesn't burn through your student credit. So go to configure database and choose the basic tier. And just click on OK. Once we're done, click on review and create. And we'll be able to see the summarized view of our database configurations. Everything looks fine, so let's go ahead and click on create. Now this process might take a while, so please be patient while the database is being created on Azure. Once Azure has finished deploying it, you should get a notification saying that deployment succeeded. Click on Go to Resource, and we will be able to manage our database from this portal. Right now we should create a new table in the database, so go ahead and go to Query Editor, and pop in your usernames and password that you recorded before. This is the place that we can run our SQL commands. So let's go ahead and create a table using standard SQL syntax. Remember, in order to pass this assignment, you need to add at least one more attribute to the database table. Go ahead and click on Run. When your SQL command is correct, you should be able to see that query succeeded. We haven't, don't worry about the affected rows because we haven't created any record in the database. But now if you go into tables, you should be able to see students showing up as a table. At this point, we've successfully created a table on a SQL database. Now there's only a few more things we need to do before we can go ahead and use the SQL database. Go back to Overview and click on Set Server Firewall. This server firewall prevents unauthorized access, but we will allow everyone to access the database. So just pop the rule in start IP of 1.1.1.1 and IP of 255, 255, 255, 255. Go ahead and click on save and, and anyone should be able to access this database with the correct username and password. Go back to the main page and we need to go to connection strings. 
We need to use this connection string later, so please save it in a text document. Don't forget to change your username and password to the SQL database username and password. Now we've done everything we need to use an SQL table in an Azure portal. We shall now create an API using ASP.NET Core on Visual Studio. Go to File, New Project, and on the left bar, choose Visual C Sharp, Web, and .NET Core. Select ASP.NET Core application and give your application a name. I will call it school SIMS and just click, go ahead and click on OK. We need to configure which SDK to use. Go to the drop down menu and select ASP.NET Core 2.2. If you don't see this option, you need to download 2.2 SDK from the link provided in the documentation. Click on API and just click on OK to proceed. Okay, now that the project is created, we need to install a few dependencies so that we can work with our SQL database. So go to the top bar and search for Manage NuGet Package. In there, so click on Browse. And search for Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server and click on Install. Now we need to do the same for Microsoft Entity Framework Core Design. Now that everything is ready, we shall construct our very first scaffolding command. You add scaffolding to your project when you want to quickly add the code that interacts with the data model. Using scaffolding can reduce the amount of time to develop standard data operations in your project. So open up a text pad and copy this code from the GitHub documentation. Replace your connection string with the connection string that you copied from Azure Portal. Don't forget to change your context name to a suitable name for your database. In this case, I will call it School SIMS Context. And there is our very first scaffolding command. In order to use this scaffolding command, we need to go to Visual Studio and open up Package Manager Console. Go ahead and pop in the scaffolding command. After you've scaffolded your database, you should be able to see two new files being created in your models under Solution Explorer. School SIMS context is the underlying session with the database and the other one, students.cs, is the model scaffolded from the database. We can use this blueprint to create a controller so that we can interact with the database with an API. To do this, right click on controllers, under add, select new scaffold item, and choose API controller with actions using entity framework. Choose the model class as the student's model that we've scaffolded from the database. Data context, just select the one we've just created. Leaving the controller name alone, go ahead and click on OK, and this should create a new controller so that we can interact with our database using an API. You should be able to see a new student controller under the controller folder, and this controller allows us to create, read, update, and delete students from the database. Believe it or not, this API is almost done. Now we need to change the connection string so we can access the database with our credentials on Azure. In order to do this, open application settings.json and paste in this command that you can retrieve from documentation. Save the application settings.json and the last step is to change the configuration service method in startup. Open the file and add in these two dependencies. You may have to change the last dependency according to the name of your file. Under Configure Services method, 
add in the following lines to to add the school SIMS context to the application so our student controller can use it. With this last change, our API is ready to go. Click on IIS Express to start our application. This will open up a browser and it will open up the default path of values. Change values to students and and lo and behold, voila, here's the API we just created. This is not very exciting right now because we don't have any data in the database. But if you see these two brackets, it means that we have successfully connected our API to the SQL database on Azure portal. You've just created a fully functional API. In order for us to interact with the API, we can either use Postman to make HTTP requests, but that's boring and abstract when we're just starting out creating APIs. In order to have a visual representation of the API, let's install Swagger. What is Swagger? Swagger helps developers to design, build, document, and consume RESTful web services. In order to install Swagger, open Manage NuGet packages from Visual Studio as before. Go to Browse and search for Swashbuckle ASP.NET Core and hit Install. This will in install the dependencies needed in order to use Swagger. We need to use it in our application. Go to startup.cs and under configure services method, add in this line to tell that we're using Swagger. You might see red squiggly line under info, hover over it and use the auto fix. By clicking on alt enter, this will import a new dependency needed for the Swagger to work. And after that, we need to go to configure method and enable the Swagger UI. Copy in this piece of code to tell that we are using the Swagger UI. Our last step before seeing our Swagger UI for the API is to edit the launch path. Go to properties in Solution Explorer and click on launch settings.json. Change all occurrences of API slash value to empty. This will default you to the Swagger UI. Now let's launch the application and it should take you to the Swagger UI. Voila! Now I want to see a list of students, so let's make a get request. Click on try it out and execute, and you should be able to see an empty array. So let's go ahead and add in the very first student into the database. In order to add a new student, we need to make a post request. Click on post and click on try it out. We need to enter some information in JSON format, so our database can insert a new record. Click on execute, and if everything goes well, you should be able to see a code of 201. As mentioned before, it's a code for success. And if we go back and make another GET request, we should be able to see that, indeed, our first student has been recorded in the database. Now if you want to see the raw data, change the path to students, whoops, API slash students. And if you're able to see that, congratulations, you've just completed this database and API module. For students that are interested in learning more about API and databases, I would recommend you to build a relational database and use link linq in ASP.NET Core to get information between tables. Make something creative, make something useful, maybe a database that can hold your blogs, maybe a database that holds your digital diary. The possibilities with databases and APIs are endless. Doing this optional step will give you a head start in phase 2. Remember the SQL database we've created in Azure portal consumes around $8 a month. So if you're not planning to use it, please make sure that you've taken all the necessary screenshots in order to pass this assignment and stop the service so you won't waste any of your student credits. Submission criteria are listed in the GitHub documentation. This project is fairly simple, so I expect all of you to pass this assignment with relative ease. If you have any questions, you're welcome to post it on our Facebook private group, aka.ms slash nzmsa. And that's it for now. That's it for now. Thank you for watching this video, and I will see you in phase two.